all the different types of receptacles they've got in your hospital, okay? Red one is for biohazard. You've got receptacles for everything. Everything's color-coded, all right? So it's kind of like, you, you know, in your home, you've got three bins for trash, recyclables, and green, whatever, okay? My sister up in San Francisco too. She's got she's got a recyclable bin, and then she's got another type of recyclable bin for like coffee grounds, eggshells, and biodegradable. I'm like, what is up with you guys in San Francisco? <laughs> you know, a bunch of hippies, <laughs> you know, tree huggers. But I get it. So they have like <clears throat> six receptacles. That's crazy. <laughs> I know, right? But it's good. It's good for it's good for our, our you know a little effort, huh? I get it. It's good for our environment. <laughs> so they got this in the hospital too. What happens if you're colorblind? <laughs> That's me. I have to look at the labels because you know there's certain colors that I don't see. Punch right? it and see if it's sharp. Then done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what is this? <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Let's talk about the different types of parenteral introduction. The first one here is sub-Q or subcutaneous injections. This is administered as a bolus into the sub-Q which is the layer of skin directly below the dermis and the epidermis. Those are your two first layers of the skin. So it's underneath the first two layers. This is subcutaneous. These are highly effective in administering vaccines and medications such as insulin and morphine. Okay. <clears throat> Intradermal. Okay. This is within the skin, within the skin made into the dermis or substance of the skin, also known as an intracutaneous injection. This is common of TB, skin tests, and allergy shots. Third one here is IM or intramuscular, intramuscular injections. This is administration of medication directly into the muscle, marked in blue or purple. What color are these? Purple. Okay, purple. Marked in purple, you have your dorsal gluteus. Boom. Ventral gluteus. Boom. Deltoid. And you also have abdominal muscles in which they use here. Okay, for IM injections. I'm gonna tell you a funny story. Uh, flu season. Again, years and years and years ago, I was working in a hospital. I'm not gonna tell you the name of the hospital. Okay. <coughs> But during flu season, we, uh, during work, we had time to go to the emergency room and get our flu shots, okay? At the time, the doctor who was giving the flu shots there, he, you guys, you guys know Ken from Barbie and Ken? Mm -hmm. When I say Ken doll, okay? Good looking blonde guy, he was probably about mm -hmm. six foot two, blue eyes. He was also married to a, so he's an ER doctor, he was married to a pediatric physician who looked like Barbie, okay? But they were a good looking couple. But anyway, this doctor in the emergency room was giving out flu shots. So the guys would go in our department, they'd go and they'd come back and they'd be like rubbing their arm, okay? The females coming back from the emergency room were doing this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you guys get my story? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Doctor's choice. Doctor's choice. <laughs> Come on, guy. It's great to be a doctor. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so they were getting shots here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> if done wrong. Do I need to say anything? Did the picture say enough? If done wrong, this is what can happen. Okay. You can get an infection. You can get an abscess. What's going on here? What is this called? Necrosis. Necrosis. They've killed the tissue. They've killed the tissue. It may also cause some deadening of the layers of the, uh, the tissue or the skin that causes it to just kind of peel and slough off. Okay? So this, this I don't have to say anything else. There were a few times where I got um, drug abuse patients coming into the department for extremities. Okay? Drug abuse for extremities. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're taking pictures of bones. Well, <coughs> here's what happens. You got pe people shooting up all the time. Okay. Eventually what happens is the muscle becomes infected. They become necrosed. 
basically they're losing all the muscle, the skin, the muscle, and all the underlying tissue. So they look normal coming in, and I said, okay, I need you to roll up your sleeve because I need to take an x-ray of your oh. arm. They roll it up. You've got, it's like, what is that called? Um, walking dead? It was very zombie-like. You had tissue, and then you had the two bones showing. Or up here, it looks like they look normal until they take off their clothes, and then you've got you know, surrounding tissue, and you've got a strip of their bone exposed in air. So just an abscess that ate away their whole skin? Abscess just ate it away. That's gross, man. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question. You know how, like, when they stick you and sometimes they move the needle around? Isn't mm -hmm. that bad as well? Can that cause... Oh, okay. It causes pain. <laughs> it causes pain, but it's not that No, it's not bad. <laughs> Again, as long as the needle is clean, mm -hmm. then you're good. Well, yeah, what, what pa with the older patients is a little bit big. The reason why they have bruises is because when you're trying to start an IV with older patients, <coughs> their veins like to move around. Okay, so you're sticking them, they're moving around. <coughs> and so the needle, remember the, be the beveled end of the needle, the opening, the lumen, okay? Half of that lumen is in the vein and part of it is sticking out. So they are receiving some medication, but some of it may be leaking underneath the tissue. And the opposite is also true too, because you've got part, only part of the bevel in, you'll also have blood leaking out. That's where you get the bruising and hematoma, because the entire bevel is not inside the vessel. Does that make sense? <coughs> yeah, it's only halfway in, halfway out. So you got fluid leaking out and you got blood leaking out underneath the tissue. That's where your bruising occurs. So here, this is IV or intravenous. Intravenous is gonna be the most common approach for drug administration for us as technologists. Remember, technologists, this is within our scope of practice, upper extremity, right? Upper extremity. <clears throat> Venipuncture devices. The selection of intra, intravascular cannula. Cannula is just a funny, just a fancy name for needle, okay? The selection of intravenous cannula depends on the following. We talked about this earlier. The type of fluid or medication being infused. <coughs> okay. The anticipated duration of the therapy. Remember we were talking about bolus versus, what was the other one? Infusion. Here. infusion. Between infusion. Bolus is large amount for a small period of time. Infusion is same amount for a long period of time, okay? So it depends on the duration of the therapy. The patient's clinical condition, are they young or are they old, okay? Do they have bad veins, do they have uh, good veins? All right. Do they work out, do they not work out? All those things come into play. Do they have soft skin or do they have tough skin? And there are other factors that we'll talk about here in, in a minute. Okay. And then again, read the physician's orders. Read the physician's orders. <clears throat> All right, the first one we're going to be talking about here. So keep in mind the next two things that we're going to be talking about here is vascular access. Vascular access. What tools, what instruments are we going to use to access the vein? The first one here is a wingtip butterfly. Wingtip butterfly. Okay, pass this around. Please do not open up the package. Please do not take it home. <laughs> is this the old fashioned type or still a use? This, this is the like, best technique to use. Yeah, best, best tool to use. Yeah, it's one of the best ones. Is it possible, like, when you start an IV, for it to, um, like, dry up, dry up, basically not be accessible anymore? Yes. <coughs> okay. okay. So what we're, what we're passing around there is known as the uh, wingtip butterfly needle. Wingtip butterfly needle. As you will notice, you have two plastic wings to it. That's the butterfly portion of it. It allows you to... 
it allows you to grab the wings with your thumb and, and your forefinger, okay, because it, it bends, okay, it bends. And so now you have better control of putting the needle in. It's like playing pool table, mm -hmm. okay, except you're, you're trying to hit a vein, okay. But these tips, wings, allows you for better control, better access of the vein. All right, so they're between 19 to 27 in average. What do you want to get stuck with, a 19 or a 27? 27. 27, right? 27 is good. They're usually about 3 fourth of an inch in length. This type of needle is for short-term therapy. In other words, we're not going to leave this in there for a very long time. Why? Because the tip is made out of stainless steel. Steel is very rigid. It's not very forgiving. So if you move around or if you bend your arm, you're also going to damage the vein and side. This is how you get that hematoma or bleeding. Okay, because all that moving is going to tear up the vein. What am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Am I recapping? <laughs> okay. Also, you guys notice as you're passing around there was a plastic cover to it? This is funnier than when this happens, okay? Have students, when they open up the package, they clean up the site, put up the tourniquet, and they're trying to stick the patient. I'm like, like, Dr. F is not going in. <laughs> well, you forgot to take the plastic off. Of course it's not gonna go in. Okay? All right, so short-term therapy, it's not made to be in there for a very long period of time, okay? Um, this is good for especially with children in the elderly, okay? because they have fragile veins, <coughs> the wing tips allows you for better insertion, better maneuverability, better control of that needle going in, okay? The wings also allow you, so once it's in place, once, in, once it's in place inside the, the vein, you just tape the wings down with a piece of tape, nice and secure, okay? But again, the patient can't move that much. Because again, it's a steel needle, okay? Decrease mobility due to rigidness of the device. Remember we talked about infiltration? Fluid, the contrast that you're putting in, may not be going inside the vessel, may be leaking in the surrounding tissue, as well as blood leaking out, out of the vessel. Okay? Because once it's placed, it's good until it moves until that needle moves, until that patient moves, okay? Then you can lose placement. Does that make sense, guys? This is where <coughs> infiltration occurs with this type of devices, but they're very good in getting venous access. And again, they're made for a short-term administration. We put it in, administer, we get it out, okay? But I want you guys to also keep this in mind. When we administer the medication, we don't, take the I, we don't take the IV out right away. We're gonna leave it in there for a little bit. Why? Well, I already put my contrast in. Why do I need to leave that in there? Yeah. Who said that? Because of a reaction. If they have a reaction, you already have venous access. What am, what am I gonna put through here if they have an allergic reaction? Epinephrine. Other, yeah, other drugs and medication, <clears throat> okay? Does that make sense? It makes sense, right? So we don't take this out right away. We leave it in there for a little bit. Okay. Second <clears throat> access device is the over the needle catheter, over the needle catheter. <clears throat> it is a catheter mounted, catheter mounted on a needle. It's basically a plastic tubing, a plastic tubing around the needle. It comes into two different parts. This over the needle catheter is in two different parts. You have the stainless steel needle and you have the plastic tubing, plastic tubing, okay? When you're trying to get venous access, you can't get access with a plastic tubing, right? That's like, remember my students I was telling you? So it's surrounded with plastic. Are you gonna be able to break the skin? No. 
okay? So what's gonna happen here is when put together, the stainless steel needle goes inside the plastic tubing and at the very end of this plastic tubing, you got enough end of that needle to expose the pointed tip and the beveled edge. Okay, so at the end, you have the needle sticking out. So now, as one piece, now we're gonna stick the patient's vein. Once we get access, once we get access, we're gonna <coughs> take the needle out and the plastic straw, the plastic tube, stays in. Isn't that great? Is that used for IV? Some for IVs, yeah. Okay, now you can do this, right? You can't do that with a very stiff, rigid, rigid steel needle. This is flexible, okay? So you can move around. But are we gonna allow them to move around? No. No, we still want them to hold still, okay? So, but it's, it's more forgiving, and any slight movement, you're not gonna have the problems <clears throat> that you would with the steel needle, in that any slight movement that you may have, that needle's gonna move, and you're gonna have what? Infiltration. Infiltration. Here you can move around, but we still don't want you to move around, but we're decreasing the chances of infiltration. But those are harder to get access to the vein with? Okay, so the question is, is this harder to get access to get vein? Yes, you have to be skillful. Okay, you have to be skillful. It's like driving, you know, going from driving a car to learning how to drive a bulldozer. Okay, it takes a lot of skill to do that. Okay. But it's better for the patient. All right. Uh, now, it says here most, most likely cause phlebitis and infections because this is for more for long-term therapy. So it's not gonna be like your needle where you're only keeping it there for the short time. When we use these type of catheters, it's usually there for a longer period of time. Do you remember back the first couple of weeks we're talking about um, different types of instruments and equipment sticking out of the body and the longer that it communicates with the outside world and the inside world, there's a greater chance of you getting an infection okay, or swelling or anything like that, this is what happens, okay. So although it's designed for long-term therapy, when we're done administering contra contrast agents, we're going to also remove that immediately, okay. What I mean by immediately is we're going to wait a little bit to make sure that the patient isn't any, to having any type of response because we want IV access in case we need to inject medication through there. But once they're free and clear, then we're gonna move it out. We're not gonna leave it there for an entire day. But they are designed to be there for entire days. Okay? All right. What's happening if they break? Uh, no, they break? No, they have a more tendency to, to bend. So it's never happened like they break or they No, well they bend, they, they can kink and they can bend. They can break a little bit, like look, like, uh, like the straw, okay, so the question, uh, here's a good point that you said, it can, it can cause emboli. What's an emboli? Blockage. blockage. What kind of blockage? Vein. It's a traveling blockage. An emboli is a blockage that moves, right? It can be air, it can be clot, okay, it can be fat, it can be anything, but it moves around. And if it moves around, it can end up where? Heart. Where else? Vein. Uh, okay, here, yeah. So you go to the heart, it can end up in your lungs. pulmonary artery. Okay, it can end up going to your carotid, causing you a stroke. Okay. <clears throat> Here's the analogy. You guys are, you, you go to, uh, let's go, you go to In-N-Out. Okay, what do you guys like to get the In-N-Out? Double, double. Double, double with everything, okay, but we're not <laughs> talking about burgers. We're going to be talking about shakes. Okay. You have your shake. What happens when there is a break in the straw? What are you sucking up? Are you stru are sucking up? Yeah, you're, you're sucking up air. Well, the straw is inside, <coughs> inside the shake, but what are you still sucking up? You're still sucking up air. This is what happens with those catheters. If there is maybe a slight break of perforation to it, that is how air gets into this catheter, and then that air is gonna travel 
This is your emboli, it's a moving emboli. So if air gets trapped into your carotid, your heart, your pulmonary artery, there's gonna be some problems, okay? Now when that happens, I'm like, crap, I just take the lid off and I just start trying to lick, <laughs> lick that shape. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Isn't there air inside the um, the shaft of the... Okay. No. question was, is there air in the shaft of the needle? You get that out. Yeah, yeah. yeah you want to get that out. Did you see what I was doing earlier? I was, getting, I was putting fluid in there. Okay. You don't want air in there. So you're trying to put you're putting fluid inside the shaft. Okay. Now, also another good point. If you get air in the veins, not a big deal. Okay. You see IVs that have air bubbles in it all the time. Not a big deal. Okay? Because it's in the vein. By the time it reaches your heart, it's already absorbed by the body. If it gets into your arteries, what is the phrase that I always like to say? What happens when something like that happens? You what? You die. <laughs> okay? <laughs> if you get air in the <clears throat> arteries, you can die. Okay, because your body, your body's like a plumbing system. Remember that straw I was talking about? Okay, if you get air in that straw, okay, your blood is not gonna go anywhere. Your pressure is going to drop. It messes up with your plumbing. Blood's not gonna flow, your blood pressure's gonna drop, your heart's gonna drop dead, you'll drop dead. Okay, so that's what happens when there is air in the artery. If it's in the vein, not a big deal, okay? When I was in the cath lab, I worked with what's called a manifold system. It's basically like four or five of these syringes connected to one main pipeline, and you're kind of playing it like almost like a trumpet or an accordion. You're manipulating all the different syringes and the valves because I've got a syringe for, for nitro, for contrast, for flush, and some other things. Okay, and these systems should not have air in it. So I'm constantly checking to make sure there's no air so that when I'm injecting the contrast into the patient's heart, there is no air in there. But one time, I was in a case <coughs> and I didn't clean my syringe very well. There was a small micro bubble and I was injecting and I'm looking up at the monitor and you can see the vessels filling up with the contrast and all of a sudden you see this little air bubble going through the heart vessels. I went, shit, <laughs> okay, I'm not lying. My heart stopped, I couldn't breathe, and I'm now looking at the patient's monitor, okay? Because we all saw it as that small air bubble went down the patient's heart vessel. Patient went to a V-fib. And I'm like in a panic, and the doctor says, hold on, just, just calm down for a minute, just calm down, okay? And we waited for just a few more seconds and the patient went back into normal rhythm. Okay, the body absorbed it right away before it went down the other vessels. So it is possible to survive with it. You can survive with it, but <coughs> I just say you can die. <laughs> if you have that mentality, if you think worst case scenario, then that'll, that'll be like your safeguard. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not gonna take any chances. With veins, not a big deal. With arteries, never, ever, ever, ever put put a, a bubble in there, okay. okay? But it happens, I mean, it happens. I mean, I've seen the best of technologists that happens to them. I've seen doctors put air in, in patients' bodies, in the artery, okay? And we all freak out and we're looking at the monitor, make sure that they still have a heart rhythm and their blood pressure is still normal. This, in this case, we saw the bubble go down and it went, it went down one of the small <coughs> vessels of the heart, not the main vessel of the heart. It went down through a small vessel. But it was just small enough and even a secondary or trituriary uh, vessel that caused the heart to, def uh, to fibrillate, go into uh, a non-rhythm. Scared the crap out of me because I'm thinking, damn, I just killed a patient. <coughs> Stressful stuff, right? All right. All right, so those are two basic ways to access the vein. Two basic. Of course, there are more out there, but we're just going to stick to the two, okay? Now, once we get access, how are we going to administer the contrast into the patient's 
body. Okay, so here's my axis. <coughs> So once we get access, we're going to tape it down. Okay. That's a hand. <laughs> okay. So it's in the patient's hand. All right. So notice again, you've got the needle inside inside the uh, the vein. Then you've got a tubing, and notice that there's also a hub here at this end, right? So basically, so when we go through this, I'm not gonna go through the step by step. I'm just gonna tell you how to do this, okay? So <clears throat> once we get access, first of all, before we got access, I should have already have all my contrast drawn up and everything, okay? So, um, all right, so I've got my, I take, Take this out of the package. This isn't sterile, right? Can I touch this? No. no. Okay, don't touch that. I take, I open up my needle. Can I touch this? No. Don't touch this, okay? <laughs> so sterile on sterile, right? Sterile on sterile keeps everything sterile. You guys are with me? Mm -hmm. All right. There should be a, let me just show you instead of telling you. <clears throat> okay. So the contrast that we're going to draw, any type of medication, okay, I'm sorry, let's just go back to any type of medication. You have a protective tab in here, tab. So what's underneath it is also sterile. So once you decide this is the contrast that you're going to use, they come in all different sizes. There's a large one, okay, there's a small one. Okay. Take out the protective tab, just flip it with your thumb. See that rubber stopper? Can I touch that? No. Can't touch that. Okay. Sterile on sterile. Follow? Before I drop the medication, you're going to pull your plunger back to the amount that you want to draw. So let's just say, for instance, I want to draw 5 cc's. So I pull my plunger back to 5 cc's. Okay, needle is going to go inside my vial through the rubber stopper. Okay, I'm going to inject five cc's of air inside. And what I've done there is I've formed a positive pressure. So there are, there's extra air in here. So it's going to want to force the air out. It just makes it a lot easier to draw. See how I just push the, the contents into my vial? By just putting air inside the vial. It just makes it a lot easier so you don't have to pull the plunger. The positive air in there forces the medication into the syringe. And no air gets in also. Well, there might be, but this is what you're going to do. Let's just say I have air in there. See, there's air. Okay. You want to purge the air out so there is no air, but there's still some micro bubbles down here in the bottom. Very tiny bubble. So what you do is tap, 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 tap. You see doctors and nurses do that? Mm -hmm. What are they doing? Taking the air. They're doing that. Taking They're the getting air. the air out of the fluid and where the air bubble is going to go. Where are the air bubbles going? Where does the air go? Up. It goes up. Okay. So now it's somewhere up here in my hub, and I'm just going to purge the air out. Okay. Now there's no air in there. All right, so now that I've got my contrast, <clears throat> what do I do with this? Sharps container. Sharps container, good, okay. Now that I've got, sorry about my voice, I've got <laughs> contrast in here, you're just going to connect it to your axis. Okay, now, when you inject, you don't inject like this, okay? You don't do it with point up. Why? Because if there's air in there, I'm gonna be pushing air through my line. 
So when you inject, you inject with the lure down. So air that's there now goes up this way. So now when I inject, <coughs> <laughs> okay. there. This is the direct push method I just showed you. Okay. When that's, that's the direct push method. When you're drawing up your, uh, your whatever your contrast, whatever, do you always do you draw a little extra to compensate for the? <laughs> yes, you always draw up a little bit more to <clears throat> compensate for that. When you're purging the right. air out, you're gonna lose maybe <clears throat> maybe half a cc. Okay. You want to get a little bit more in there. So all right. The, yes. With the direct push method, it takes all the air out of the tube and goes up into the syringe, right? Say that again. With the direct push method. Direct push method, uh huh. Yeah, the air in the tube that, like, before you inserted it in there, uh -huh. there's air in there, correct? Air in where? In the. In this tube? Yeah. Well, okay. So here's the question. So before I connected it, isn't there air still in here? Well, this is what you're gonna do to get rid of the air, okay? So it's gonna have a cap on here, okay? Make sure there isn't anything coming out or going in. So there's gonna be a safety cap in here, okay? So to get rid of the air on the line, I'm gonna let blood come back. So now blood fills up the line and it's going to be fluid on fluid, okay? Fluid on fluid, not fluid on air. So then the direct put push method is getting the air out of the in-between? No, the direct pour me method is just hand injection. Oh, okay. That's all it is. Okay. Yeah, direct push method is just a hand injection. That's direct, that's direct push. Okay. Let's go over here now, next one. <coughs> next one here is the...